Good morning. morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It really is wonderful to be here today. Thank you for having me. And um, for those who I've not met, um, I'm going to keep repeating my name for you, so you will eventually know who I am, hopefully. I'm Rob, and I'm the curate here. I'm fairly new, so... um, getting to know everybody. And if you, are new, if you are new here today, we get a really, really warm welcome. It's great to see you. Um, it's great to have you with us. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at some of the parables of Jesus. Um, so uh, Nick spoke to us a couple of weeks ago about the parable of the sower, of God's generosity, that he doesn't just sprinkle a little bit of seed here and a little bit of seed there, but he extravagantly throws fistfuls so that it lands on bits of land which, are, which just aren't receptive or suitable to grow a healthy crop, as well as the good land. And last week, Nick also looked at the parable of the weeds and at God's justice and how this really is good news for the oppressed, that God really will one day make all things new and right any wrongs. This week, we just heard in our reading that we have a plethora of parables. It's quite difficult to say. A plethora of parables. Five of them. Um, And you'll be pleased to know that I don't intend to cover every single one, let alone in any detail. (laughs) But we will be looking at two or three of them. And where they might seem to be talking about different things, hopefully we'll we'll discover that there is kind of a link there. Um, Before I get into into the passage, though, I just want to briefly remind us as to what we mean by a parable. Earlier in the chapter, in Matthew chapter 13, Um, Matthew explains that Jesus made use of parables throughout his teaching. So much so that Matthew says that Jesus never spoke to the crowd without using such parables. So clearly they were a key part of Jesus' teaching and his strategy when teaching his disciples and wider followers. Simply, parables are stories which use everyday pictures and scenes to explain a bigger truth about the kingdom of God. Because they are stories... They are open to interpretation. And that's kind of the point. It means that the hearer or the reader has to do some work of interpretation and that the reader or the hearer can't just remain neutral. They invite interpretation and because they are open-ended, different people will respond differently to the same story. Indeed, the same person might well respond differently at different times. Now, will you hold that in your mind as we look at some of these parables today and reflect on how you respond and why that is that you have responded like that? Now, who here has ever played hide-and-seek? Oh, come on. (laughs) Or sardines? Um, Both are games that I used to love playing as a child, and I remember long summer evenings playing Manhunt, in a local park where I'd be hiding in a bramble bush, desperately trying to be the last person who was found. It's basically another name for sardines. And um, I play hide and seek with my children. I've got two children. um, We have two children, Toby and Libby. And Libby especially loves it. And the shock and surprise when she either finds me or I find her is just fantastic. She definitely errs towards the fight rather than fright or flight. Um, uh, tendency, and uh, it can be pretty dangerous. She really does go for you. <laughs> so just a word of warning. If you ever play hide-and-seek with Libby, just be, be, wear some armour or something. Um, now, in our text today, Jesus tells the story of a man who finds hidden treasure in a field and then sells everything. He gives up everything he has to buy the field so that he can have that treasure for himself. How do you respond to this? Who do you see as those characters in that story? Are you the man? What is the treasure? Is it the gospel? Is it the kingdom of God? Is it Christ himself? Often when thinking about this parable, I have put myself in the place of the man and the gospel as the treasure that is to be found. Now, of course, the gospel is the true treasure of the church. But the other day, a friend said to me, What if the man in the story was Jesus? And I haven't been able to get it out of my head since, and I've been chewing it. 
And interestingly, in the other parables, parables which we've looked at earlier in, in the last few weeks, the sower, the farmer who, pla- plant, who plants the good seed, the people in these parables, Jesus then reveals that he is that person, that that person is himself. So why then would he suddenly change tack? For a moment, let's just kind of interrogate this a little bit further. I wonder whether Jesus is not primarily the treasure hidden in the field, or the gospel is not primarily the treasure hidden in the field, or the pearl of great price. Nor are we the ones who act in this way to sell all that we have to possess it. Such a reading makes us the main actor in our, in our salvation and makes Jesus kind of passive. And we know, don't we, that we cannot work for our salvation, but that it is a gift from God. Remember what I said earlier, that we, we, may, all well, we may well all respond differently to the parable. And I'm not saying that the gospel isn't valuable. <laughs> it is the church's treasure, but we need to first know firstly that God himself, or Christ himself, is the actor. Like in these previous parables, Christ is the sower, Christ is the sower of the good seed. Christ is the man who gives up everything for the treasure. But what is this treasure? Now, if there's only one thing that you remember from this sermon, I hope there's going to be more, but if there is one thing, it's this. You are God's treasure. I'll say that again. If there's only one thing you remember, let it be this. You, I, we are God's treasure. God, through Christ, found a treasure of such infinite worth that he was willing to sell everything, to give up everything for you and for me. In the 9.30 service, they also read from Romans chapter 8. And it says this at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously graciously give us all things? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And as Martin Luther once said, my Lord who has redeemed me, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy and precious blood. This is the gospel. You cannot work up your own salvation. It is only possible in Christ. Salvation isn't meant to be back-breaking. It is identity-making. Salvation isn't meant to be back-breaking. It is identity-making. We are God's treasure. This isn't a new understanding in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7 in the Old Testament, God says this over his people Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession to be his people, his treasured possession. But what we also discover from the scriptures is that Israel wasn't just chosen for their own sake. They were to be holy and set apart, yes, but why? For the sake of the world. God said to Abraham that through him and his descendants that all nations on earth would be blessed. Now, in the same way, We are not only chosen for ourselves, of course we are chosen for ourselves, but not only, not only chosen for ourselves, but for the sake of the world. And this is where I think the other reading of this parable is perfectly fine. (laughs) That we have this message, this identity from God, which is of infinite value. Who here watched the uh, coronation of the king, King Charles III? Some of us. A lot of us, good. Um, I don't know if you saw the bit where he was surrounded by all the pomp and ceremony of state, the priceless jewels, the outfits. I mean, how many times did he have to change outfits in one service? (laughs) Quite a few. The lords and the ladies, the orbs and the scepters and the crowns. He 
He was presented with the Bible, with the words. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. That's a good phrase, isn't it? The lively oracles of God. We have a message, a gospel of infinite value, and the challenge is there. What will we do? What will we give up for the sake of this gospel? One of the other parables which we heard in our reading was that of a woman who um, hides some yeast in some dough. It says that there was three times the amount of flour to the dough, uh, to the yeast. But the yeast permeated every part. St. George's, we as the church are the yeast. How are we reaching every corner of our community or communities to make sure that we permeate it with the message of Jesus? Are we willing to give up looking professional at work or looking foolish to our friends and family because of our, because of our faith? Now, I'm going to tell you a story, but before I do this, I'm going to tell you, this only happened once. <laughs> so I am not an expert in this. <laughs> I've only had the courage to do it once. Um, but there was this late, I used to work in a call centre, and um, it was as dull as it sounds. And um, there was this lady who came in, one of the supervisors, and um, she had this great big bandage on her face. And I said, Anne, what's happened? And she was, it was a freak accident. She was walking up some stairs... And a picture fell off the wall and hit her on the bridge of the nose and broke her nose. And during, when this happened, I was commuting back and forward to New Wine, which is, a, if you don't know, is a Christian festival, which was held in Shepton Mallet at the time. And um, I didn't have enough holiday, so I was going to work in the daytime and then commuting to Shepton Mallet, doing the evening session staying the night and then commuting from Shepton Mallet to Bristol to, to uh, go back to work in the daytime. And I just felt the Lord say to me, pray for her. And because I was going, it was new wine and I was kind of in the zone, I was like, <laughs> I was like really? Really? Oh, I, I, it wouldn't be fair on work to, to pray during work time, would it? No, that, that would be unprofessional and it would be not honouring of my employer. No, Lord, you're not, you can't mean this. And it just, it just again, pray for her. Pray for her. And eventually, after about four hours, I uh, plucked up the courage and I walked over to her desk. And I said, and you know I'm a Christian. I believe that God heals today. Could, could I pray for you? And she said, yes. Um, and what, what happened is on, our lunch, on my lunch break, I, we went out to my car because I didn't want to do it in work time. I wanted to honour my employer. So we went to my car and I just put my hand on, hand on her shoulder and I just prayed for God to heal her. And at the end, I said, has anything happened? And she said, no. <laughs> except, except that her nose tingled when I prayed for her. And I was so encouraged. Even though she wasn't healed, she, didn't, she was a non-Christian. She didn't know her nose was meant to tingle when I prayed for her. <laughs> she didn't know how the Holy Spirit manifests in the way he does sometimes. Um, and she just had this little touch of God. Now, a few years later, she'd left work and was working in a different company. I had a Facebook mes message come through a messenger. And it just said, Rob, I'm stuck abroad. My dad's dying. Will you pray for him? Now, the only reason she knew that I was prepared to pray for people is because I'd prayed for her. Now, I've only done this once. <laughs> so I'm not very good at this. So I'm preaching to myself. But what would it look like if the church, we, us gathered, all of us here today, prayed for people in our daily lives as a matter of habit? What would the, what would the world look like? What would Taunton look like if it, all of us prayed for people, people who don't believe in Jesus, and um, either saw him move in ways we'd hope him to in healing, or not, but meeting, us in meeting them in different ways. What would, what would our town look like? I've got a bit of a challenge for you there. Will you challenge yourself to pray for somebody you know this week 
who isn't a Christian, whether that's in person, see what comes up in the week. If you meet somebody who needs, needs praying, will you have the guts to actually take a moment, offer prayer, and see what God wants to do? Another challenge, we have Alpha starting here in September. Now, I've been asked to head it up, which is great, but I don't know any non-Christians in Taunton. I only came here six weeks ago, and I've met you lovely lot, but I don't know anybody else apart from that, so I will trawl the pubs and the, uh, and the bars in town, but I need your help. And that's either, if you'd like to come and volunteer on Alpha, please do speak to me, but also, who do you know who, do, who doesn't yet know the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus? who doesn't yet know that they are God's treasure. It's not a difficult invitation. I promise you the food will be good. We'll eat good food. We will have a chance to watch a short message, um, well-produced video message, and then we'll have a chance to chat about what we've heard. And let's see what happens. See how God uses that alpha course in September but please do be thinking about who you can invite I think it's the stats are over 90% of people come on an alpha course because they're invited by somebody they know friends the gospel is good news it is of infinite value this gospel that um, we are God's treasure that our identity is in him Together, let's become more confident in sharing it to those in our wider communities and those we know. Amen. Let's, let's pray a second. God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you that you, uh, you see us as your treasure you see us as your children, that you love us. Thank you that our identity is in you and not in the things that we know we do wrong all the time. Father, would you help us to become bolder and more brave as we seek to reach those in our communities who don't yet know you, that they might come to know that you love them and that your, your face is turned towards them and that you are gracious to them. Amen.